Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 146 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobolski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. As I'm sure most of you well know by now, my favorite sources from the Middle Ages are the ones that deal with the everyday lives of medieval people. I'm always interested in finding out more about what their concerns were, what they loved and worried about, and how they took action to improve their lives and other people's. I mean, it's no wonder that I just wrote an entire book on medieval advice. While I usually keep my focus on the practical tips that probably did work and that continue to work, I spend less time on advice that medieval people themselves thought was dubious and sometimes hilarious, but I have to admit that this is also some of my favorite stuff. This week, I convinced Peter Konechny to read one of my favorite medieval books, The Distaff Gospels. Full to the brim as it is with wit and wild advice for timeless problems, this is a book that reminds us of the full picture of medieval life. Our conversation on superstition, sarcasm, and sisterhood in the Distaff Gospels is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Peter, for joining me to talk about the Distaff Gospels, which is one of my favorite primary sources. I absolutely love it. So thanks for coming on and and giving me a chance to talk about it. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. Like I started reading it just uh, this week because I've seen you write about it and it sounds so good. And this gave us opportunity and like fun piece. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, it's super fun. So before we get into it, we were reading, I think we're reading the same one, which is the Broadview edition, uh, which is edited by Madeleine Gier and Kathleen Gray. So for people who want to read along at home, (laughs) we're using that one. Or people who, I think there's going to be a lot of people that want to pick this up afterwards because it's just a super fun book. All right, so let's get into it. This book is called The Distaff Gospels. And for people who don't spin at home, Peter, I'm not sure you spin a lot of thread at home. (laughs) I dropped a hobby a while ago. (laughs) For people who don't spin at home, a distaff is something that you see in medieval art as something that looks like a big old cone on a stick. And it's basically a stick that holds the flax or the wool that's going to be spun and keeps it from getting too tangled up for the people that are spinning with a drop spindle. So you often see women with distaffs in their hands in art, and they are often using it as a weapon against their husbands as well. <laughs> but if you see a cone on a stick, that's a distaff. So it's a it's a very womanly symbol from the Middle Ages. So this was written in the 15th century by a seems like a clergyman by the way he speaks and the way he's trained. And it's a book that collects a lot of superstitious stuff that women are talking about in these little meetings that he sits in on in the long nights between Christmas and Candlemas, which is Groundhog Day for North Americans. (laughs) So he sits in on these gatherings of women who are talking about all sorts of things. And he makes fun of them a lot, but it's just a really fun book to read so this is your first time reading it yeah yeah it was first time reading it you get right away the narrator is in the form of a scribe that has to copy down all these things and the premise is that these women are coming every night to spin and they decide to give a gospel of uh, the truths and things that should be passed down to all other women Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like mocking scholars meeting up and discussing things. That was the idea. I think just like, here is my satire on it. Yeah, because they're gospels. So they're basically like the word of God, but it's coming from these elderly women. And he says he's written them down under protest. He went to visit and they pulled him in and said, okay, we're going to meet for six days and you're going to write down everything that we say because we think that it's very important. So he does this reluctantly. And uh, oh. makes fun of them the whole time. <laughs> oh, the funniest part was just him. Every night he's trying to slip away. They go on way too long. They're like talking till midnight. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's kind of begs them like short enough. Let's meet earlier. He's trying to find a way to excuse. Sometimes they drag him back in. I imagined him as a boy because at one time he at like when it's like I've been there kind of scribe since childhood. Something like <laughs> on those lines. Right away took me back to being a young boy listening to my mom and her friends chatting. <laughs> That's how I imagine Harry got this from, was just years of listening to this. Yeah, these are the literally old wives' tales because these are women who are talking about the most important things in their lives. So let's get into like what kind of stuff are they talking about? Well, they're talking about things like marriage. They're talking about things like pregnancy. 
having children, how to predict the weather, how to take care of yourself if you have a fever. And all of these things are what we would put into the bucket of superstition. Now, I'm always really wary about people talking about the Middle Ages and superstition because I think that that is a brush that paints the entire Middle Ages without understanding the rationalization behind a lot of their thinking. But these are legit superstitions, right? These are things like if you step over a cart, yeah. this is what's going to happen to you. So there's a lot of things that are familiar to people who have recognizable superstitions today. So these are very much superstitious behaviors. Things yeah. like if you want to find out what a woman is going to name her baby or if it's going to be a boy or a girl, you need to sprinkle salt over her head when she's sleeping. And then when she wakes up, pay attention to the first person's name that she says. So if she says a girl's name first, she's having a girl. If she says a boy's name first, then she's having a boy. So it's that kind of thing that they're talking about in the Distaff Gospels. And these are kind of semi-believable, right? And some of the notes they kind of say like, oh, this kind of pops up in another book, or there's uh, some sort of like medieval rationale for it. We don't know if these are true ideas, but they ring of authenticity, right? Yeah, I would expect that, and it's very hard to prove to people actually believe these particular superstitions, but I would expect that most of them are probably superstitions that people held at the time. And this is the guy that's making fun of them because they're really consistent with the type of things that people have superstitions about now. And they're very consistent with the type of things that we find in remedy books. Like if you're having trouble with your husband or something, you can write some words on a leaf and then eat the leaf and then things will get better for you. Like this is very similar to the stuff we see in actual medical books. So I would expect that these are not too far distant from what people were actually practicing at the time. And the editors have gone very carefully through all of them and, and found, as you say, examples in other texts and shown which ones are consistent. So I think that he doesn't have to make up new superstitions because he feels like he has enough ammunition with these ones just as they are, you know what I mean? Mm. Indeed, indeed. And so he's collecting sayings. And in, with most of them, he adds glosses. Medieval writers tend to add little bits of extra information. So he has those as well, just to kind of ring again at satire and authenticity of it all. And it's so funny. Right, exactly. So glosses are what people are doing to add their own commentary to something that already exists. So the church fathers are adding glosses to the gospels, the real biblical gospels, for example, like when Jesus says this, St. Augustine will say, what he means by that is this. So yeah. all of these distaff gospels also have glosses, as you say, and the glosses are not by <laughs> the author, they're by other women who are sitting in the circle. Yeah. And one of my favorite ones was like, if a child has too many godparents, then that child is going to have that many spouses or mistresses or something in their life. And this one person pipes up as the gloss and says, yeah, that's definitely true because my husband had like way too many godmothers and he's had at least three mistresses. And those are only the ones I know about. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of stuff is what they're glossing with, which as you say, Peter is like a total spoof on the scholarly tradition. Yeah, you just have to imagine this group of women around the table with more women around them chiming in afterwards. So what's interesting about the Distaff Gospels being written down in the 15th century, this is when people are starting to have the suspicions towards women or they're starting to look at women's wisdom sideways as possibly being evidence of witchcraft. This is something that didn't really happen before this. So it's interesting to see that this is situated in the 15th century, it's written down in the 15th century. And there are little gestures towards that. So the editors have pointed out that a lot of the place names that the scribe mentions at the beginning of each day's scribing is that a lot of these places that he mentions are related to places where they have talked about witchcraft or there has been that kind of discourse in the public. And there's a few other gestures towards that. For example, what's interesting is the first woman who starts this off and seems to be the ringleader is named Isengrim, which is the name of the wolf <laughs> in the Renard stories. Mm. This wolf that gets outfoxed a lot. But she is an elderly woman who is now in the profession of a midwife. And those people are obviously under a lot of suspicion in the 15th century. So it's really interesting to see this women's wisdom that has these kind of undertones of witchcraft and suspicion around them. But... It doesn't come across as 
accusatory towards these women. So even though they're saying this wisdom, none of it is actually touching witchcraft. None of it is suspected as being witchy or anything like that. So it's just a very interesting situation in place and time. He gives these biographies, these kind of short biographies of each of the six women, noting their age. And like when he says these are old women, he actually gives like, oh, she's 70 or this is 65. Often comments on their appearance or lack of. So (laughs) other things that kind of make them look bad. Like I love it how he says, this woman used to run a house of pleasure. (laughs) <laughs> and she's still very good at setting people up with gentlemen callers <laughs> exactly he says it in a kind of a, a praise worthy <laughs> which is kind of funny old women who have secrets right yeah yeah well the secrets are not very well kept though <laughs> indeed oh, indeed one of these things about the women being older is that they have often been widowed or they have had several husbands over the course of their lives and so this comes back around to another cultural thing where widows especially were thought to be really lusty creatures so like if a woman is widowed she's already had like a taste of the forbidden fruit and she can't <laughs> she's going to be insatiable after this and what's yeah. funny is there is one I think it happens on Friday because on Thursday, the scribe goes home and the women are like, it's Thursday, we should party. So they have a party late. And then on Friday, when he shows up, they're kind of recapping what happened at the party last night. And they're ribbing this one woman about her going back and maybe enjoying her husband afterwards. And one of the women is kind of incredulous, like, you still enjoy sex at your age? And she's like, I'm only 77. Like, of course (laughs) I do. And it's supposed to be fun and ridiculous, but like she's got a point. <laughs> they, they're often laughing at these tales. Like every time he kind of finishes off, he's like, and these women were like laughing away. And there's only like one point where they get into a, a serious argument, mm-hmm. which was, uh, I think it was related to Jesus in Mary's womb. Was he riding on a horse, you know, like <laughs> the, the, a donkey or, a, you know, and it's like they had to kind of break up the talk and reset it because so, people were angry at each other. But he kind of makes it sound like the women are also kind of joking with each other. This is all a big laugh. Yeah, exactly. So it's not like the Malleus Malficarum, for example, where they're like, if women say this, they're very seriously having relations with the devil or anything like that. These women are sharing their stories and they're laughing hysterically at all of these things. And for anyone who's ever been to a wedding shower or a baby shower, (laughs) this is exactly the same kind of stuff that you see there where people are talking about their superstitions and they're laughing about it and they don't take it seriously necessarily, but they're talking about things that are important to them like family and babies and things like that. So it's it's a very familiar scene at the same time where you have these women who are just enjoying the company of other women and really just poking fun at each other and just enjoying their company. It's really, it's fun in that way too. Yeah, it it, it certainly, it comes across as like, this is a happy kind of time. He's trying to tell you, don't take this seriously, especially at the end. By the way, don't take this, any of this seriously. You know, I'm having fun. It's a funny story. You can pick it up and like, you'll start laughing out loud as you read it. (laughs) Yeah, and... (laughs) A lot of the stuff, as we were saying earlier, is funny, not necessarily for the superstitions, but for the glosses that come afterwards or the commentary that women have. Like, yeah, that happened with my husband, too. (laughs) Yeah, the glosses add a little more ridiculousness to it. Yeah, but most of the time the glosses are that complicity with the women who are making it fun or elevating the joke or something like that. Sometimes people do naively make a comment that, you know, everyone is going to look at them sideways about afterwards. But most of the time, it's women that are adding zingers afterwards, which is really fun. Okay. I noticed a whole batch where there's no glosses. And her words are a little more different because a lot of deal with agriculture, medical stuff. It's a little more serious presented that way because she's also presented as the, maybe the wisest of them all. Yeah, medical advice. So if you have a fever, here's what you should do. And people take that one person pretty seriously as a sage. And there, yeah, there isn't Mm -hmm. a lot of talking back to that person. Most of the talking back is when people are talking about their husbands. Indeed, indeed. As described, like I can imagine that he was either running out of pages 
or he was kind of running out of ideas at this point. Well, he says he was running out of pages, but the question is, is he actually a person that's sitting down with women and scribing? No. I don't think so. He's somebody no. who's probably just sitting down at a desk later mm, and yeah. pulling these things into his mind. Like he's not actually yeah. furiously writing like <laughs> <laughs> like a stenographer. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. Says, he says he is, which is right. part of another layer to it, another story on top of the story. You come across him and he's like, uh, I'm writing under pressure. I am just getting tired. I just kind of imagine that he is pulling these stories out of his childhood, just stuff he's heard. He's just taking it like a next level. Yeah, exactly. He's turning it into a funny book to share with people. Of course, you're not going to write down all the things that people say. If they're not funny, don't write them down, <laughs> right? There's yeah. some editing involved when you're making a book. Yeah. But, but I was thinking about the the subject matter. We were kind of briefly talking about this. The subject matter that people are talking about and when we're talking about superstitions and the type of stuff that's in here it really occurred to me that this is people women especially trying to take control over things that are hugely important to their lives but they have absolutely no control over i was thinking about whether people would say we are just as superstitious now maybe mm -hmm. less mm -hmm. and i think we are probably a little bit less superstitious for the reason that we have a bit more control over <laughs> things like we can tell what a baby is going to be before it's born. <laughs> we don't have to sprinkle salt on people's heads, you know, to find out what the gender of a baby is. And it may matter less mm -hmm. to us now what the gender of a baby is. But at the time, you would need to know stuff like, who am I going to marry? Because that's going to be someone you're going to be with for a long time. What is going to be the gender of my baby? Are they going to be strong? Are they going to be born with health problems? Other things like sickness, pregnancy, adultery, death in battle, like these are all things that are addressed by the superstitions because the people who are saying these things have absolutely no control over those things. Mm -hmm. And when you do something small, like sprinkling salt, maybe it feels like you are taking some control over something that, again, is going to have an, a huge impact on your life. But mm -hmm. You can't control the gender of a baby. You can't control whether your husband's going to be a coward in battle. Like these are things that you have to just kind of <laughs> just wait and see what happens. And that's hard for human beings to do. It brought back to me another podcast we have on Medievals.net by Xantium and Friends, Anti Cadellis. And the conversation was about simple believers and the kind of idea that 99% of the people don't have a, a huge theological understanding and are not picking at the intricacies of Christianity. And they have their own kind of beliefs that just get inherited and passed down and ideas. And that's what's real to them, right? That's their faith. And that's their, their way of thinking. And we shouldn't kind of look down on that. We don't go out thinking, hey, let's parse what St. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians said on line five. And how do we make sense of what's happening around us day to day. And that's where they're coming from. That's how I kind of approached it. Like these are people we would call simple believers. Yeah. Although I don't think that it has to do with intelligence or knowledge or anything like that, because there is absolutely no way to control these things. <laughs> like there's no way, there's no way even up until the last century, you know? And so I'm thinking about superstitions. Last night I made popcorn for myself. And when I finished dressing it up, there was salt on the counter. And of course, my first thought is a superstition I heard before, right? You pick up the salt, you toss it over your shoulder, and that will smite the devil or <laughs> get the devil in the eye. Yeah. And we were talking last week about demons being very real when I was speaking with Renata Blumenfeld Kaczynski. So like that's something that maybe we don't really think about right now. You never have control over that. Maybe that has to do with faith. But things like trying to predict the gender of a baby, or if you're going to be able to have a baby, or yeah. things like that. I mean, it doesn't really matter what your faith is. At that time, there's no way to find out. So yeah. yeah, I think it's separate. And I also think, as you're saying, we shouldn't judge people for superstitions, especially because a lot of them still last. Like, yeah. Can you think of any superstitions from your childhood? Because I can think of some right off the top of my head. Oh, you know, they uh, jumping over a crack on the sidewalk, <laughs> just break your mother's back. Uh, you know, oh, there was all kinds of things. And like, and like some of them, my, my mom would tell me, or you learn it on the schoolyard, right? And you're trying to make sense of things. And that's how you do it, right? So. Yeah. Well, the point I'm getting at is that there are lots of people that will avoid a crack in the sidewalk 
these days that wouldn't call themselves simple believers, right? Would yeah. call themselves yeah. like knowledgeable mm -hmm. and maybe yeah. faithful or not faithful or scientific believers, but mm -hmm. they're still doing these things. And there's a throwback to that. So I, yeah, I don't think this is necessarily a fact of simplicity, yeah. but a traditional way of trying to take control over things that you don't have any control over. Like if your mom's going to have an accident and break her back, yeah. you know, you feel like you're doing something to help her by not stepping <laughs> on the crack. But things in here, like there's something about not giving a woman a knife on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve because that's going to cool your relationship. Well, I remember people giving gifts at showers where they would give a set of knives and also a penny because you were trying to not sever the friendship. So nah. it's like these people don't actually think that's going to happen just by giving a set of knives, yeah. but just in case, let's give a penny as well. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. exactly, exactly. Medieval uh, farmers having to deal with pests and they would write letters to the vermin, like uh, rats, and please leave. <laughs> we will leave this letter and like bribe them or or make an order like hey the parish priest has demanded you leave this field alone and that's trying to control what you can't control <laughs> yeah exactly and some of these things they would fall under that place that's between superstition and ritual where you do things that might be insurance against bad things but they're also good habits to have or they might be actually useful so like there's one in there that is probably just in there to make fun of these women saying like if you want a cat to stay in your house for three days, you should rub butter on its feet, <laughs> like on its legs, and then it'll never leave you. <laughs> of course it won't, because it's going to be expecting butter from you from, from now on. But things like if you start the day by crossing yourself and washing your hands, you're going to have a better day. We know that you're going to be cleaner if you wash your hands. So all of these things, they work together, not just being insurance, but I think sometimes it's good habits that will help you. And maybe if you have something like this in the background, it's helpful. There was another one that was suggesting like, if you leave crumbs on the table at night and a mouse eats them, then everyone in your family is gonna have black teeth from now on. Mm. And like, this tough. is one of, one of these things that's a superstition, I suppose, but it's also just a way of getting you to clean up your crumbs <laughs> because it's maybe not enough incentive mm. on its own. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or yeah. finishing up all the flax on your distaff on a Saturday night means that if you leave it till Monday, your linen is never going to come out white. Yeah, come out white like how the Germans do it. Yeah, this is why the Germans don't have good linen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about work ethic, right? It's not just about people being superstitious for the sake of it. I think all of these things are kind of bundled up together. So it's a useful book, even though it's making fun of these women for whatever beliefs they might have. It also, to me, reveals what their actual concerns are, a lot with the husband, a lot with the children, and then with things that happen in the family home. There's only, they like, could say, a couple instances where they actually talked about warfare. I was actually surprised they talked about it at all, but there's, like, only two there, and there's nothing... There's not much about friendship either. Like, you're, they're not, like, talking too much about how they deal with each other because they're doing fine. They don't talk that much about how to deal with each other? Yeah, like there's not much like, hey, my friend is gossiping about me. What should I do? <laughs> well, maybe you don't bring that up in front of a friend that might actually be doing the gossiping about you, right? All the women of the community are there that day, so maybe that's why. Just to me, it was concerns that they're trying to tell the world. A lot deal with children. Pregnancy, raising them. Mothers often will have a lot of concern over their children and not just like the day-to-day, -day, but their future. Yeah, exactly. And there's things like, I think if you take the baby's bonnet and you dry it on a sharp sword, the point of a sharp sword, then that baby is going to grow up to be a strong and brave knight, which is all you can hope for. It's not something you could plan ahead for all that much, but it's what you're hoping for for your kid. Yeah. Children and husbands are... <laughs> They, I mean, they're integral to women's lives, right? You can't support yourself all that easily by yourself. What your husband does with your money, which is one of the things that they talk about right at the beginning. I hate it when my good for nothing husband spends all my money. That's going to have a huge impact on your life. So these are, yeah, these are the things that they're most concerned with because these are the things that are going to have the biggest impact on their life. Yeah, husbands come off pretty terrible in this book. 
No one has a good husband. (laughs) (laughs) No one has a good husband. No, they're always off having affairs or being lazy or spending other people's money, which is really consistent with the type of book this is, right? Where you have that archetypical old woman and uh, deadbeat husbands too. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, here's how to make your husband love you more. I think there was something where you have to put a leaf in his shoe that will help your husband love you more. Or there's really, there's one that's super gross where if you want your husband to love his children, all of them equally, sneak some of his urine into his washing water so he washes with it for nine days and then he'll love his children. Oh, wow. You're hoping that he doesn't find out later. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I cracked up at that one. But I mean, these are things that, again, are essential. Like, will your husband love all of your children equally? Is he going to love this particular kid? These are things that are going to have a huge impact on that kid's life. So, of course, women are trying to take care of this as best they can. But even things like making sure that the laundry doesn't boil over or that they have good weather for hanging their sheets, they'll pray to St. Clair, which is kind of a pun on like clear weather. But (laughs) again, you can't control the weather. But if you pray to St. Clair, well, maybe that will help a little bit. And it's not all that far from actual religious belief, you know, when they're combining prayers and other movements of the body or objects like leaves or pieces of parchment, that kind of thing. Yeah. There's like multiple versions of the same thing, like tests for pregnancy, you know, is a boy or a girl. There's there's several different versions of that. Yeah. Well, I think that when it comes to this type of idea or a superstition that's passed down, it's funny that I think that the ones that still exist, that are still around, are based on the same type of things like the knife one with the penny i've seen that before like not severing your friendship or again with gifts if you give someone a wallet you shouldn't give it empty you should give it with a penny in it or something or not walking under a ladder because you could have an injury they deal with injuries in this Mm -hmm. one too one of the interesting ones that i thought really stood out to me was if you're going on a journey and a hair crosses your path you should retrace your steps three times and then go on your journey and things will be fine. But there's no mention of cats. Like now that's cats, right? If a black cat oh, crosses true, your yeah, path. Yeah. There's no black cats in this, even though there's a bit of hints towards witchcraft. I thought that was interesting. So like if a hair crosses your path, everybody, you need to retrace your steps a couple times just to make sure everything's going to be fine. Talking about cats is pretty much in a positive and that may be gender based because it's by this time in the middle of Europe, there's a, a real distrust of cats among men, right? And they can associate with women. Here is the rabbit, which is something that men hunt for. I don't know. It's probably a practical thing where if you have hairs running out, you have to be careful because they can spook the horses and you can fall off. (laughs) Probably rooted in something real. But the three times thing is really important. And reversing things is really important too, which is, I think, something that we still see in superstition not that long ago. Like if you walk around a church... You have to walk around at Wittershins or something. something. Right. I don't remember which one you do first, but you have to walk around it counterclockwise, perhaps, to right. undo the spell type of thing. And that's something that you see here. Things happen in terms of three and you have to go backwards. One of them that I thought was really funny was if you wake up in the night and you have to go to the bathroom and you step over your husband to go, you have to step back over him the other way on the way back or else he's going to be impotent. So make sure that you do that. <laughs> You step over your husband in the night, step back over him in the opposite direction when you come back so that you don't render him impotent. You don't want to do that. Yeah, very few of these solutions are, I would say, impractical, right? Like, There's a couple where it's like, you have to get the blood on Midsummer's night and uh, use it six months later or something like that. If this happens, just this simple cure, something that you could do right away. That deals with it. So that, that kind of brings more of the authenticity. Like, because I remember we were talking about magic texts and their spells are incredibly complicated. We'll need dragon's blood if not a unicorn can do, right? Uh, <laughs> in here, they're, oh, you do this, walk around with your cat three times around the center of the house, you know? <laughs> All right, that's, that can be done. Yeah, no, that's true. You don't have to wait for a certain feast day or something for this to happen for most of them. The only ones I remember are you have to collect something on Midsummer's Eve. Mm. And that's a really easy day to mark. So it's not Mm. like there's some that that this has to happen on a Sunday or it has to happen on like the Sunday after this. But they're all, as you say, very easy to calculate or they're things that you can do right away 
to yeah. undo what you might have accidentally done or to make something better in the future. So yeah, they're very, very practical things that you have to do. Are there any other ones that were your favorites that kind of jump out at you? I love the urine one. That was, I think, the funniest one. There was another one where if you want your son and your husband to love each other very strongly, you need to feed one of them the tip of your dog's ear and the other one the tip of the dog's other ear, and then they will love each other forever. <laughs> Like, that's one of the ones that's harder to manage. That one seems to be heading towards the direction of the <laughs> medical advice that is harder to achieve. But there's other ones that will make your husband love you or love your kids that are a lot easier to do. If you're spinning, you stop on a Saturday night, like you got to finish it up. Otherwise, yeah, the clothing will be ruined come Monday morning, things like that. I thought that was really kind of cute and funny. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about this one now that I think about it is it has a lot of concerns with relationships, but it doesn't have a lot of concerns with beauty or surface type stuff. There is one I think that tells you how to prevent wrinkles, but most of the time it's all about relationships and how to make things better for you or for your family. So it's very different from other things that are giving suggestions for women. I think mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting that he's making fun of these women but he's not making fun of them in that direction, which is kind of interesting because often the criticism towards women in the Middle Ages are they're vain, right? Mm -hmm. So this one, he doesn't really get into that so much. <laughs> he gets into more like they are way too lusty and yeah. they're superstitious and they are uneducated and they uh, talk too much. There's cackling mm -hmm. involved, right? There's always cackling. <laughs> <laughs> people talking over each other too much but he doesn't really get into the vanity all all that much which i think is interesting and i do wonder if that's something that he thought about before he started writing that or if that's just he just didn't come across it as much as as maybe some other writers did if he kind of learned this maybe as a kid as he kind of maybe alludes to that he he's learned this by listening to people around him and maybe this is what he's picked up on cures and medical advice he may not have heard of because like it just like, it never resonated with him because he wouldn't know how to do wrinkles he's it's not something he'd be concerned about like he probably would remember them talking about how to deal with dad and how to deal with you know whether they're dealing with brothers and sisters or what she would say like oh this is what i did for you when you were little you know but, <laughs> you know put a leaf in your uh, tummy you know <laughs> rubbed it and <laughs> Like, okay, thanks, mom. <laughs> so I think, he, like, if he's kind of basing it on that, I can see where he remembers certain things and other things he just would have forgotten about. It was just went gone right over his head. So he's kind of remembering and kind mm -hmm. of exploring that aspect. I have a lot of sympathy for this scribe. There's a guy, you my bro. You did God's work there. What? Are you going to explain that? You have sympathy for him? Why? <laughs> I don't know. One man with a group of... 50 women around him talking about stuff. And he's like, this is most inane stuff. And I'm like, he says that at points. Oh, I feel for him. You did good work. Beer for you. All right. <laughs> I think I'm going to stop you there before you keep shoveling you yourself go. any further down. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> In the essence, it was really, it's just a really interesting text. And it's so unique, right? Like, I don't think there's anything quite like it. No, it exists in more than one manuscript, but I haven't come across anything comparable except for collections of actual advice. So like I haven't yeah. come across satirical advice for people like this before. I've come across the Trotula, which you know, talked with uh, Monica Green about on the podcast before, and that's actual advice for women. And that does concern a lot of things like how to take care of your, your body or your children that kind of stuff. It's not this type of superstition that is not based on much. So it's it's very different. So it does have a lot of things that it borrows from things like Fablio, like the mm. idea of these old women cackling together, or the idea of like deadbeat husbands. But mm. no, I haven't come across anything that is exactly like this. And that's probably why it sticks out so much in my brain. <laughs> And to me, it's just like the, the structure of it, like having the women talk, uh, having this kind of story around it. He could have literally just wrote these proverbs and sayings down like that. But he has events happening around him where he's taking part, which I thought was really kind of unique. And I honestly really enjoyed that framing of the story. Yeah, it's got good 
framing. It's really consistent. It's just well put together. And it's just something that is, I think, enjoyable for everybody to read. And it's very accessible. So the translation that, I, again, I should drop their names. The translation that's by Madeleine J and Kathleen Gray, it's very good and accessible. So everyone can read it and everyone can enjoy the silliness and the wit of these women. It's fun in so many ways. Yeah, it is a pleasurable read, that's for sure. And just enjoy it. That can be a, a fun evening for you. It was for me. I took about three hours to read it. Yeah, I enjoy it a lot. And I'm actually going to be leaning on it. I mentioned in my book launch, I'm going to be writing a new book on medieval manners. And there's going to be a bunch of stuff in here that I'm going to lean on, which I think is going to be awesome. So, Peter, what are you working on? What's going on on the website this week? Well, you know, I'm really glad we had a chance to do this because we've been a bit of a tough week. World headlines dealing with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And we changed a lot around what we were kind of planning to do for the last week because we've been trying to do articles related to what's happening in Ukraine. We've got about three right now dealing with the historical backstory, uh, places like the Cathedral St. Sevilla in Kiev. We also have a, a really interesting piece by Ken Monshine looking at the medieval community in Ukraine and what is happening with them on the ground. And there's like a lot of reenactors and uh, also people that create uh, medieval goods and armor. Arm Street is like one of the world's largest providers of medieval replica material, uh, armor, clothing, things like that. They're actually on the front line in Kharkiv and they've been actually blogging about what's happening in their city. So we're gonna try and cover that. I said various kind of posts be up. Those things haven't come up, but I'm going to be trying to get to them this weekend. But uh, yeah, it's very fluid right now. And my heart goes out to all the people in Ukraine right now. It's quite the situation. Yeah, of course. I think that all of us are really feeling it and all of us are sending all of our best wishes and love and hopefully supporting our own governments that are putting pressure on Russia. So people can find out more about medieval Ukraine on the website this week. Yeah, yeah. If you uh, just come onto the website, there's right now three major articles. We hope to add a couple more over the weekend. One person kind of commented, we didn't really cover other kind of events. And that's kind of true. We have the resources a bit more now to do this. But I'm a person that follows world events quite a bit. So the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, or the civil war in Ethiopia, or uh, the fighting in Yemen, I will look to see how we can delve into what in some cases these things have to do with the medieval past and try and go forward to do that a bit more and kind of cover those angles because I think people really want to understand that. All right. Well, thank you, Peter. It's good that uh, you're mentioning that people can go and find resources there. So thank you for that. And thank you for coming on to talk about the Distaff Gospels. It's always good to see you. Thank you. It was a very fun night of reading and I really enjoyed it. Thank you <laughs> so much for letting me do this. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you, as always, to all of Medievalist.net's patrons on Patreon.com for all your support. You'll find amazing stuff for patrons like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, a book club, and exclusive maps by Tina Ross. And you also get to feel good about helping Medievalist.net's podcasters to keep bringing you fun historical content, including yours truly. So thank you. For all the details, please visit Patreon.com slash Medievalist. For everything from distaffs to doges, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an awesome day. Yeah.